I'm sure you do, bless the Lord. I'm going to ask Lois, uh, share a testimony with uh, some people uh, at a, it's so great to do that, share the testimony with people uh, this week, and um, we were talking about it, and I asked her to just give a quick um, uh, report on that. Thanks, Lois. Thank you. Well, it's really, truly, is all the Lord that I stand up here today and I want to give him all the glory because it was a miracle for myself as well. I didn't want to do this um, singing at the town hall. I was asked to do it and it seemed everything came against me. My throat was sore. I thought I was having a heart attack. It, it really, really terrible. And then I thought, oh, Lord, I don't want to do it. So uh, you're getting me out of it. And then I realised it wasn't him getting me out of it, it was the other one that was trying to stop me from doing it. The morning that I had to do this singing at the town hall, I woke up about two o'clock in the morning and the Lord said to me, because I was worrying, I'm thinking, I've got to to tell him about Jesus. You know, I was getting myself in such a state. And the Lord said, Lois, you do not have to throw yourself under a bus to exalt my name. And that made a lot of sense to me because I realised a lot of my life I put myself down. And when I do that, I attract other people that put me down because then they control me and I'm always trying to be good or trying to have people like me. And the Lord showed me, be yourself. If you lift others up, I'll lift you. Now, I've been spending a lot of time with some ladies on a Saturday afternoon. I go there and they're like my little evangelism. Because believe me, I don't want to sit in a goldfish bowl when there's a whole ocean out there that need Jesus. And the only way we'll reach those people is to listen to them, hear them crying, laugh with them, talk with them, drink with them, eat with them, become their friend. Now, I'm telling you that little quickly because these ladies I involved in the, in the actual um, show that I did at the town hall. Because I designed clothes, I asked these ladies to get up and do a fashion parade at the end of the singing. But before I tell you that, God also said to me, I want you to encourage people to lift them up, because if you do that, the focus will shift from you onto the grace of God. And I want to tell you a miracle. As I was singing the last song, I didn't feel like I was even singing it. And a lady came up after and she said, thank you for lifting Jesus. I saw the presence of God up there. And I bursted into tears because God confirms his word. He really was there. And it was wonderful to speak to them and say that I love Jesus. It wasn't big and and carry on. It was just my life. People say, don't tell people you've been married four times. Don't tell them you sew your clothes. Then I think, why? It's the truth. It's my life. And thanks be to God and his grace, we're all still standing because of the Lord. I know where I belong in Jesus now. It's a market ministry. It's people of the world that need to hear about Jesus. So nothing's going to stop me. I don't want to be a singer and just a song. I want to be an encourager. I want to have people be lifted up. And then Jesus will be lifted up. So glory to God and thank you for allowing me to share because it was a miracle for me. And if you'd seen those girls, it encouraged others. You know how old some of them were? 83 was the oldest lady and she looked beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Thank you. All right. Amen. Bless God. That's so, uh, you know, it's really so great to share the gospel of Jesus, it's uh, that's really awesome. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lois. Amen. Well done.
Well, let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 21. I'm going to take us today to a post-resurrection uh, account. Uh, we were speaking last week of the Great Commission following Easter. Uh, nice to see you back, Derek. Bless the Lord. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's been well. Nice to see you. Uh, we were speaking about uh, we were speaking about the post-resurrection account about the Great Commission and. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, what Jesus does as he declares the Great Commission says that there's a new king. He's the new king uh, to whom all authority belongs. Amen. And uh, uh, in heaven and in earth. And uh, he empowers this church in just incredible way on this mountain in Galilee starts an unstoppable force, an unstoppable phenomena that's called the church. And... Um, I feel like today as we go to John, and John and um, John has an account, Luke has an account, and they take a little bit of time after the resurrection. They talk about some of the things that Jesus has done in Mark and in Matthew. It's fairly short. But in, uh, in uh, Luke and in John, uh, he's, uh, the, those writers are taking some time as they talk about the post-resurrection story, the post-resurrection narrative of Christ, uh, and what's happening. And, um, you know, it's amazing because what you would think would happen after such an incredible event as the resurrection, you would think uh, you, that these events that that we, you see Jesus at uh, would be something more substantial and sub significant. Imagine the fact that someone is raised from the dead. Imagine that all the things that have happened to Jesus, uh, if you were scripting perhaps the things that Jesus should do, would you script this? Would you script the fact that he would be with two people on the road to Emmaus? Would you script the fact that he would appear to a few disciples? Would you script the fact that they would have a Bible study? In these days that are fairly short, you would not script it if you were in charge of the schedule, I think. And yet this is exactly what Jesus is doing. He's spending time with a handful of people. He's is, is having food with him. He's having a meal. And when we come to read this passage today in John chapter 21 and from verse 15, uh, as they stand there uh, around this uh, breakfast fire cooking fish. You, you know what's happening here? That unfolding here, Jesus is defining ministry. <laughs> it's defining how we, as a church, uh, the, some, pr some things that he releases around this fire uh, still apply, still are powerful still are relevant for eternal. And as I spoke about uh, last week, saying that as we gathered um, uh, together today, I wanted to talk about some of the things just from my heart that I feel are personal about where, for eternal, personal for you, but personal for us as a community where we are going to, uh, 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 the things that Christ is saying to us about where we need to go. Almost in a way, just like round that fire. <laughs> Jesus talking to these uh, disciples, the things that unfold. Um, and uh, as we go through that today, just to look at three things that are so powerfully relevant and applicable for us as a church, for our next season, for you in your life. So let's read from verse 21, from verse 15, just through to verse 19. I think that we have it on the overhead uh, here as well, 21, 15. Um, okay. After breakfast, uh, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Jesus, uh, yes, Lord, Jesus, Peter replied, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And he says to him in verse 18, I tell you the truth, that when you were young, you were able to do what you liked. 
You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to him to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Let's just pray. Father, as we spend this time around your word today, uh, believe with everything in our heart that when, we, when you speak to us and when you gather us together around your word, it is for a purpose. It is for a purpose that our, the purpose that our life should worship and glorify you and praise you. And I pray, Father, in these moments that none of that is lost. None of that uh, escapes uh, from us uh, that what you want to do here today and touch us in the way that you do would be just so incredibly awesome, I pray. Holy Spirit, move amongst us in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to begin with a story, something that happened to me this week, uh, that in terms of the context of these verses in John, you know, John, John takes some time to tell the story, to get us to where uh, verse 15 is. And uh, I, I had this thing, um, dialogue with my son that we can have from time to time. Uh, and he's an expander, does not does not quickly come to the point on something. And he uh, he was talking about a business name, and he's, it was some business concept, and he's really great, thinks up these things. But then he says to me, Dad, what's a, what's a business name for this? And I said, and he, he told me he's one, and I said, no. I said, I don't think that's a great business name. And he said, you, he says to me, he talks to me because he knows I'm going to give him a hard time. I, it's not really the truth, but you know, I'm contraire, he says, for the sake of it, but it's not the truth. And so, so, he, says, so he says to me, all right, well, what's the name? And uh, so we, we go through a whole heap of names, and generally it's a case of shooting down your suggestion uh, or, or saying, nah, that doesn't sound right, whatever might be the case. And um, I said to him, if I was going to disclose anything to him, it would require a 50% partnership. Which he said, you know, I could go jump if that's. A, <laughs> so, so, so I think it was Thursday. Thursday, he finally gets to the point. Thursday, he gets a name, and he rings me up. Right now, he does this in conversations. You know, guys generally they they go to the point. They're short. They just make a point and yes, tell us the bottom line. What's the summary here? And. Uh, but he doesn't care. And he doesn't care if I'm busy or not. He wants to go through the whole story and everything. So, so he, um, he says to me on Thursday, and I'm on my way to a meeting, which I'm late for. And he says to me, Dad, you know where this discussion started? Let's go. I said, oh, no. No, please, let's not do that. Just tell me what the name is. So, uh, well, well, he did. And I said, you know what? That's a really great name. I kind of finished that conversation still, still pretty quickly. Uh, but it finished the conversation. But I, I think, you know, that, uh, that expanding, telling a story, and I, and I bet it's uncommon with guys. I think most guys want to just get to the point. I think ladies can expand stuff, right? Amen. No, it's not always the case, but you can, right? So, uh, so, so what? Ha so anyway, John, John is taking some time to tell this story. He's take, he's telling you who was there. He's telling you what the conversation was about the fish. He's telling you about uh, the fact that they caught nothing. Then uh, you know he's telling you what happened when they seen Jesus and Peter got some clothes on. You know, in Bible accounts, when things can be quite short, he's taking a long time. He's getting up to about verse 11 before John says something that's really significant in terms of the sentiment and what's really happening. Now, none of this is unimportant. But John, it's about verse 11 that he gets to before he actually talks about it. But, but, but something starts... Something unfolds in this meeting that is so extraordinary. I hope we get it today. I hope we really do. And uh, you know what? I'm going to need some people here to just help me. I'm going to need four actors. Carl, you look like a good actor. Who wants to? I, I could have ladies. It's not going to be a big job. I just need four of you here in an imaginary fire around here. So who, who can I get? I'm going to choose you if you don't come. Amen. Sharon, you, do you want to come? You don't, I don't need you up there anymore. That's fine. We could get a, we could get, come on, who else are we going to get? John, you look like a likely suspect. Sorry, mate. Bless you. <laughs> come on up. And uh, who can I get to be Jesus? Uh, jo huh? 
Uh, hold on, put it back. <laughs> Come on, this shouldn't be hot. Okay, uh, uh, Joe, are you going to come and help me? You're my trust. <laughs> amen. He's a pastor. He was a pastor. He said, he was a, Amen. Uh, just stand up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick this morning. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Now, how many have I got? I got three. Have I got four? So maybe a couple around here in a semicircle. And just a bird of space. You know, you know, I can definitely get, you know, the good thing about Joe is that he'll always improvise. He'll always write the scripture. Amen. Bless the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now, here unfolds th- these three things that are so important. So, uh, uh, Jesus is, is standing there. And, you know, this whole meeting comes about because what is happening here is that Jesus has come to find them. (laughs) So if they represent the disciples, Jesus has come to find them. Isn't that amazing? That he has come to them on on the water, back at their fishing, he has come to find them. Like he still does today. Like he's done for every one of us. Amen? Jesus has come to find us. And you know that what that declares about us is so incredibly significant. That God comes the whole redemptive story of God. That it is God who has come to find us. Come to meet with us. And and does the same for us. That we think that we have got to where we are somehow by a design of events. You know, by some set of circumstances that have got us here, even sitting here this morning. And forget it's the hand of God that's on our lives. Amen. But you know what it does? What it says about each individual person? It says about the, the value and the worth of inclusion with Jesus. Amen? About who, what that makes us to be. That it's no longer things like education. It's no longer things like our status. It's no longer what we don't have. Uh, it, it is nothing like that. We are included because Jesus came to find us. Amen? And you know what it says for us as a church? Uh, as people come to remember that message, that people are here, new people are here, because Jesus has found them and brought them here. And those values, (laughs) that worth that Jesus places on them, we must place on people. There's something about what's going on here. There's something about what's happening here that is, uh, 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 they're underlying truths uh, that are so good that what has happened here in the discovery, uh, in in this event uh, that Jesus had, this is a restoration. This is a restoration. These are people who were without. Uh, Jesus for a time now they're there and Jesus has brought them Jesus has brought them around himself and he's restoring them (laughs) it's a message as we uh, uh, that you pick up even in the text of hey where's uh, did you bring some fish let's have that together let's eat together there's that message in that scripture that just says we're we're in we're in communion we're in fellowship with each other (laughs) And given the events of what has just happened, it's extraordinary. You know, the fact that that not long ago, these were people who denied. In fact, it is still so tender here that that some of them are not even sure what's going on. And yet Jesus is there standing with them. Including them. And it tells us something else. It tells us about the patience of God with us. That God is patient. Because he knows 
that who's standing here, Jesus knows. It's not all they're going to be. <laughs> they're still going to do some things. There's still something in each of them that's going to do something. And these messages ring loud and clear for us about forgiveness, about the fact that this restoration is based on forgiveness. It's based on the fact that there's no account held to them. And I think that one of the most important messages I wonder that I feel the Spirit is giving to us today is to live with the Spirit of forgiveness. It's to live with the Spirit of forgiveness. Live with that Spirit that embraces people around the fire, embraces people around Jesus, is to forgive. So the reality is that we are going to always have a reason and a need to forgive people. People are imperfect. People are not yet who God wants them, and we're included in that. People are not yet who uh, God wants them to be. And so standing at this fire, some of these, th these things happen that give a message to us. That give a message to us. But what's the centerpiece of this passage? What is the clear centerpiece of what's happening here is Jesus' link uh, to ministry and to service uh, on the basis of a relationship with him, that we love Jesus. You know, nothing else is going to make the distance. You'll get tired <laughs> if you're doing it for another reason. You won't, make, you won't make it if you do it for another reason. But if on the basis of service, on the basis of love for Jesus, our service is founded. How extraordinary is it? You know, there's some things here. There's some things that uh, happen in this question. And, I, and, and there are some theological views uh, and, and worthy of reflection, the words that Jesus uses in this one. I'm not, not going to do that today. But I'm going to just say that what is beyond dispute in the service of Jesus, no matter where, no matter if it's us in our lives, uh, or us in community as eternal, is that we have to have Jesus the center of it. A love for Jesus. We have to keep that the focus. Keep Jesus the focus. Keep Jesus the reason. And uh, th there's something about this scene, you know, that uh, when we read it, we can, we can gloss over it, read through it, it's fine. But, but you want to pick up the sentiment of what's going on here. That when Jesus in a, in a pointed uh, discussion in the presence and in the company of disciples is talking to Peter. Is, and, and talking to him and asking him three times, do you love me? It has to actually get the attention of those, that group of people. And do you love me? <laughs> Extraordinary in... Uh, uh, in this, I mean, you, you, you know, when we ask, it's okay, we will declare love for sure, but, but there's something uh, uh, about this. And you know what? It is not Jesus putting Peter under the spotlight. It is not. It is not, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But, but what is happening here is Jesus uh, in, this, in, this, in this emotional Discussion because John picks it up. John says Peter's even hurt by the repetition of this. So there is emotion here, and there is, and it's as you know, and it is pointed. This is not a side discussion. This is the discussion of the moment. Do you love me? <laughs> and uh, reminds you about something, doesn't it? Doesn't it, doesn't it remind you about uh, what Jesus talks about and the whole sum of the law of the prophets and the teacher one day that comes to Jesus in Matthew, uh, uh, chapter, I think it's chapter 22, and says to him, what, must, what are the greatest of the laws? 
And Jesus says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength, and that you should love your neighbor as yourself. It's a message upon which everything concerning our lives is based that we love the Lord. And isn't it something that in this setting, he's standing with them, he's standing there with them. Ask him, do you love me? And service and what we do in ministry, what we do has got to focus on Christ, on a relationship with Christ, on a love for Jesus. We have to keep that. We have to, with everything, hold on to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, it, and it's like this. It's like what Jesus is saying in the illustration. Joe, can I have your hand? Just your hand. No, just your hand. Just hold it up, turned for me. And it's like what Jesus is saying, that the basis for service, if John represented service, has got to be founded on Jesus. It's got to be founded on Jesus. That our service has no other foundation but Jesus. Just stay like that for a moment. And then, and then a third thing happens. Uh, a third thing happens here. Uh, and I know, I know that some of us know this. I know. As that, as that conversation goes on, as Jesus in this commissioning moment of saying to him that service is inextricable from love, love in me, says to him as the conversation goes, There's a time coming when the seasons are going to change in your life. The cost of serving me is going to cost you. It's going to be high. It's going to be absolute. And Jesus, Jesus uses the analogy of age and uses the, uses the story of our years. You know, when we, uh, as we get older, talks about it in the context of when you were younger, you could go where you like, but now as you get older... You don't do those things that you like. Speaks about it in the speaks about it in the, our, our ability to do the same things. I was at a funeral on Wednesday this week, and I realized people around me are getting old. Uh, <laughs> my wife says there's a defect in our mirrors in, the, in in our house. The only person that can't see themselves in the mirror is me, and so I criticize everything except myself. Amen. Bless the Lord. It's a good mirror to have. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. But you know what? And, and here is why I think, here is why I think Jesus is not playing with Peter. Jesus is not looking, Jesus isn't suffering from an esteem issue when he asks him, do you, do you love me? Imagine this, that in this commissioning call, uh, Jesus knows what service is going to cost. He knows that what is going to happen here, John says, is that he knows the means by which Peter, what this is going to cost him. <laughs> and we know it too well. When we uh, have declared... In our love for Jesus and our service, when we have declared that, cannot understand why it is that we should find ourselves in difficulty and suffering. Cannot understand it. You know what? I feel like the Spirit has shown me that, and, and you know what? There aren't answers to this. What, what answers do you have that explain why events that are random sometimes seem targeted? We, we just know that it seems to be something that has afflicted, uh, something that has been the portion of men and women who have served God have had to endure struggle and difficulty and challenge. But I wanted, you know, I saw something today. I saw that that, that that difficulty, that that cost 
of serving Christ is not in isolation. It lives on this same foundation of Jesus. It is, it, it, it bases, it finds itself in the context of everything that we know and have declared about Jesus. That we love him. Amen. That our lives belong to him. The context of suffering and difficulty is we're, we're able to endure it. Paul says. Because we've settled that. I've settled it. I want to finish the work Christ has given me to do. I don't hold it dear. It does not take away the suffering. But it makes it have some context. Because we know that underneath that, Christ's hand holds us. Amen. Amen. And the last thing is this. Are you guys okay? Are you guys all right? I use it to. So, is it okay? Sorry about this. I didn't even think this was out. This was in the gym. This is like the, it's like torture. Sorry about that. All right. So you can leave. So you okay? Can you leave your hand there for oh, a yeah. second? Okay. All right. Uh, so just, <laughs> it's like a marketplace ministry. Amen. Bless the Lord. Anyway. Hallelujah. All right. Fine. I'm going to finish here quickly. Um, and you know, and I don't know exactly how to illustrate this, but here's the last point of this. Jesus says to Peter, in spite of all this, Peter, in spite of this, um, follow me. What, what does he mean by follow me? Follow me because uh, he's going? No. Follow me because, uh, as in some of the scripture, it accounts already Jesus breathed on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit came upon them. And that same Spirit we know that lives, that raised Jesus from the dead, lives in us. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bless you. Give him a hand. Thank you very much for that. Just imagine it. Bless the Lord. Carl. You know, um, I, I think about, thank you very much everyone, but I think that they are such incredible realities about how we are commissioned. That we are commissioned uh, by Jesus including us. That we're commissioned by our love and our relationship with him. That even in the midst of struggle, we're supported by Jesus. We're kept there. The things that he knows about us still says to us, follow me. <laughs> still says, follow me. Amen. Amen. And I think, I think about where we're going, and I'll wrap up with this, and maybe if I could just have some music. Just want to close with this this morning. There's some things that I believe that the Lord wants us to focus on as a, as a church. And I can tell you what those things are, that we, that we stay, and, and that we're working on them. We continue to work on them, continue to pro prioritize them. One is that we, uh, that we bring people to Jesus, we focus on the word, uh, that we connect with people, that we are spirit-led, share the gospel, and teach. Th those are the things, and we're, you know what, I... I, I believe that we're working on those things. We're working on, on them. We're taking steps. They have to stay in front of us as a ministry for where God is taking us. I, I, I know that. Uh, that's, not a, that's beyond debate. But I think that the Lord wants to say something specifically to us today. The things that are really important. Out of, out of today. Is that we make it our business to see people how Jesus sees them, to put value on people, to do that especially with new people, include new people, to make the effort to build connection, 
I'll just to pay some kind of limited service to it, but to do it in an absolute way. And you know what? Perhaps after today, following today, you'll search your heart and ask God what to do about this. The second thing that's so important for where we're going is the aspect of forgiveness. I don't think you can overemphasize it. The fact that we're forgiving. The fact that we are forgiving. Uh, the fact that we... Um, uh, that we seek forgiveness, you know, for things that, that we do wrong. Apologize to people. Don't hold on to pride. And the third thing is that we're patient with people. We're patient. We don't, we don't, we don't make rash decisions. We don't, uh, we don't, we don't cut people off because they're not at the standard we want them to be. We don't include them. And I think that if we would ask the Lord to help us establish just those three things in our own lives. You know, John had a prophecy. John, John, had a, John Knox had a prophecy and I want to share it with you. The prophecy was Jesus saying to us that that this, that embracing each other, and especially new people in our church, was such a key for our growth. That our whole growth and what God would do hinges on it. Now, if that's the truth, if that's the word, this is not a job that you can just put on the pastor or on the leaders of the church. It's something we all have to do, amen? It's something we all have to do. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I want to ask you today that if you, sitting in this place, would think about this for a moment. Think about if Jesus was asking you what he asked Peter. Do you love me? And it became such an appointed uh, question of Jesus that Jesus would ask it of you several times over. Do you love me? Do you love me? Is that the basis of your faith and of your relationship with me? What would you say to him today? How would you answer that? Do you love me? The time that we spend with God, you know, the time that we spend hearing from him. Would we, uh, how would you answer that? Perhaps for some of us this morning, that's a starting point. It's just to say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to answer that question this morning. And even if my answer hasn't been good to now, I'm going to change it. You know, you can do that right now. Change the answer that you give to that question. Jesus, I love you with all my heart. I love you with all my heart. And what about, uh, what about today for some of us that are, that are dealing with this question of how much it costs us to be here today? How much it's cost us to serve Jesus. Aspects of it that we don't understand, that we've complained and fought with God. Sitting here today with that and saying, God, how come it is? That you have not come through for me, uh, yet you have commissioned me and called me, but I feel like you've let me go. We're wrestling today with that high cost of service. I want to speak a word to you today and just declare this message of Christ that he's underneath. His hand is underneath.